So Tanya, how many of you know that your institution, as Kathleen says, has a vision which incorporates online learning as a key component? Would you just raise your hand online? Well, oh. qualify your question. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to know how many institutions actually have it incorporated, or do you, yeah. you know whether it is or not? <laughs> Thank you. All because right. I know we don't have it, but I'm not sure that's the question you want answered. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, let's start with those who know what their vision and mission is, and they know that they do have incorporated in that mission online learning as a key component. Three, but actually you have a institution. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah, like in my case, uh, all the we are going on online programs, but it does not have the mission or vision. So that's that a caveat as well. Yeah. I think that we have a pretty good vision on the four credit side in undergrad and graduate programs. I think when you're looking at the institutional role, there's work to be done on outreach side and non credit aspects. Uh, so, uh, this makes sense because when you're making strategic decisions as an institution, you can go with, you know, maybe the more. They are the opposite. Yeah. And at Buster, right. we were easier. So, I'm actually rooted in the School of Math Professional Studies. <coughs> um, and we started actually with our master's degrees and professional degrees and things like that that we use adjuncts and have a little more control over. Mm -hmm. And just now, there's conversations about. For credit undergraduate, and what must that look like? And there are concerns about cannibalization and what are we going to do in that area. So we're kind of a little bit the opposite yeah. in our in our world. Um, those of you online, uh, Brad, um, Lucky Joan, I haven't heard you yet. Would you like to try your microphone? Oh, Joan. <laughs> Okay, we can always try. <laughs> All right, you guys online, if you want to try your microphone, that's great. If not, keep typing. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Well, at, um, do we even know about the topic? Yes. For me, uh, the institutional role always has to center around what problem your university faces that online could help. And Different universities have different problems. I've been where they needed to increase enrollment. I've been where they have too many enrollment and they need to just um, try to educate people as cheaply as possible to get them in and out. And then I've been places where retention is the main issue. So uh, those those solutions will all lead to different kinds of online education and emphasis in different ways. So I agree that you have to start with the mission and the problems and then work your way down. Perfect. So I guess I'm going to go a little off script here, but that's what I do. Um, <laughs> so what do we think is, what are some of the key messages, maybe the key questions that we can go back and ask our institutions, or what information do we want to share with them, and, and how do we get, I guess in my institution, it's, it's awareness that online can be quality, and what we do is quality. In fact, um, I, I said a very controversial statement not so long ago that I firmly believe that our process and our documentation and really only unit that has instructional designers is possibly of a higher quality than maybe some of our traditional courses where they don't have the faculty training that's required, they don't have the supportive mechanisms and things like that. And I was told very quickly, hush. Um, but what does that look like? Um, so we know what we need to know. How do we elevate that? How do we get our vision and mission, you know, online learning to be part of that conversation and consideration? I think that's a great question because I, in my institution, uh, the, the, the mission or submissions uh, uses language such as uh, creative delivery, um, <laughs> innovative program. Oh, program. And under that, I, it's my understanding falls fall online programs, and and yet I I don't always sense that the that the institution as a whole has wrestled with online learning as as a strategic um, move uh, 
in, in sol as, as you mentioned, sol solving the larger problems of the institution. <coughs> and so how, how do we how do we get at that? I'm I'm hoping you will tell me. What does it take? I don't know how often we look at this document and say, well, what, it, it's not just online, but I think, I think if, without saying it directly, online would fall under this from the institutional perspective, but I, I don't think we have really wrestled with what that means strategically. Yeah, I, I think, going back to your comment, that for every institution, even within our little niches of, you know, the R1 research of the community college, I think that the solutions are going to be very different based on the needs of the culture. Yes. Um, you know, we learn culture, be strategy. Um, but also, um, there's an interesting point you brought up about the programming. Um, I recently had a discussion about what what is it, what was your term innovative program? Yeah, innovative uh, uh, innovative programming creative. and creative delivery. Okay, <laughs> so innovative programming. I had to ask the question: Is that subject matter? Because we do that too sometimes. We're just you know innovative. Right. We're just an analytics Short program. Term or, yeah. yeah, it's considered innovative because right. we're the first to get to the market. Is that what you mean? And creative delivery. Can we can we define that uh, at least internally a little bit more? Specifically, and for us, I'm very grateful for actually the new LMS. I'm capitalizing on it every step of the way um, to get the word out, get the training out, get that blended piece out. Just to say, and I'm validating everything. I mean, honestly, to be quite honest, there are things that faculty call me up and say, "I would love to put the classroom in just a video," and I'm like, "Oh, how 1990!" But I don't say that. You know, I, I encourage them, and I'm like, "How exciting that!" You know, take them, meet them where they are, take them to off the baby step further. And then hopefully they'll call back when you get one more step. And eventually we'll get there. I mean, that's my current strategy until tomorrow when I hear from all of you and I change it completely. <laughs> so you can on faculty outreach and training. Yes. I think that's important. Uh, I think you got to, we're going top down, the MOOCs for us. I think tomorrow, a little plug for us. Uh, about <laughs> and that was actually my university then. People were like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this online? They didn't know that we've been doing it online at my school for six years. Many were shocked. So what happened was the strategy actually came from this MOOC project that we were part of that the program signed with Coursera. So it's a very interesting way of that is what raised the concept of online and blended. And all of a sudden, he set the purpose down and he gave us seven strategic things out of MOOCs that apply to other things. So I'd also encourage you to look at those initiatives and see where you can sort of raise that um, awareness. Because it's now coming top down and bottom up because we had faculty. We put our MOOC faculty on a road show. And I was with them sometimes and would talk about, well, this is just one thing. But here's all this other stuff that you can do. And here you can blend to do these things. So kind of top down, bottom up. Hopefully we'll be in the middle. I'm sorry, that's kind of comment and then to you. Oh, well, this is, I'm, uh, I'm interested in these sort of leverage points because when I hear you talking about um, the, the labels, the tags, the innovation, there are certain institutions and faculty that that's the leverage point to get faculty involved because it's, it's innovative and cutting edge. And for others, it's access, right? It's, this is part of our mission. We, yeah. have to, we have to reach for a remote rural area, we have to reach students, you know. And, and then those are another leverage point for a lot of the brand universities who don't want to be, you know, left behind in, in this brand new, you know, that captured everybody's imagination, right, with, the, with you know, what, what, the, what the elite institutions were doing with MOOC. So, it, and then there's the political aspect, and then there's legislation, and there are states that are, are not, not just motivating, but mandating through legislation what's going on with online learning in the state. So there are sort of leverage points that are influencing what institutions do too that would be useful both, both in terms of what the, internally in the institution, what it takes to motivate the, the, the faculty, and then externally with the stakeholders what the leverage points are. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, for me, I keep talking about our LMS, but it was a surprising leverage point. And I now realize that I'm milking it for all it's got, you know. And and you know, it was very surprising to me. It wouldn't have been something 
and it, it wasn't until recently that it hit me in the head. Like, wait, this is not training and engagement and new things. Let's, let's leverage. So even those IT type things that you may not think about as they look around. Um, so for timekeeping, let's go on to our next question, which is, what are the options to act upon this topic as institutional leaders? So it kind of flows from what Doug talked about. What, what can we do? What are our options? Yeah, sorry. That's fine because he's connected with the new question. Yeah, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the things I learned at, at the UL class was the 10 second uh, elevator technique. So uh, it was uh, um, helpful to uh, touch base with the proposed. And I recognized that uh, to that, uh, the institution has it, is 300 seats to which the max, maximum seating capacity. There's no more land, no more buildings. So it would be too expensive, expensive to continue uh, expanding. So through the leadership lessons and, and the, the techniques and everything, we were able to, uh, um, let's say, influence or motivate the institutional leadership to engage on a two-year um, strategic uh, plan where we invited from uh, instructor level, staff level, up to deans. Everyone was included in a two-level two, two committee, the larger committee and then the executive committee. And as a result, we come up with a document with strong recommendations for that. And one of those was the transition for, for, for the LMS. And as well, the fact that we were uh, about 55 years in the market with what we call off-campus programs. The fact that we traveled to other uh, locations, national and international. And uh, that was uh, becoming a non-cost effective and, uh, because part of the goal of the mission is to reach more uh, globally the, the, the health uh, sciences programs. So that's the reason why the um, online learning and digital education become more and more uh, strategic. So the, I learned through the program and I learned through interactions with all of you that it's possible to reach the institutional leadership and become influential at and, and that level and explain and, and create an environment to uh, motivate an institutional change into that direction. So that, that is very important uh, to open, to maintain open, transparent communication because that creates the trust and therefore will come the engagement from uh, the university leadership up to the faculty because faculty always will resist. But as long as they understand that this is for the benefit of the students and we place the students in the center, not only as a customer, but as part of our mission, because through them we will change the world in some, in some levels, then everyone start opening their mind. We we need to do this. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that I learned this week from Mr. Reagan, the first day boy in the back, uh -huh. is that we have to focus on one thing. And for us, a couple years ago, it was moot. And and I used that as a lever point to drive a higher level conversation about why are we doing this? This being Moves in a minor point, but this being online learning is a bigger point. Um, so that about as far as I could go. Then the next thing was scale you know, that. And what I learned is to focus on one thing um, and, and not scatter. Before I was very much like, we can do this, we can do that, or the thing I had to do. Um, now it's like, wait, we can focus and leverage this in this way. Now figure out how we're going to leverage the next big thing. Um, and I've gotten a lot farther these last couple of years by doing that than I did my four years before as assistant director trying to sort of scatter the paint everywhere. So that would be my sort of takeaway from Larry. I'm stealing from you. <laughs> okay. What else do we, um, you know, what are our options to act as, as institutional leaders in this area? Do you guys online and type or use your microphone? You are bound and determined to get them to <laughs> I am. I'm really good. This is what I do. <laughs> we can shame them into saying Whatever it takes, you know? I figured they're here because they want to be part right. of the conversation. I've been that left out person online. Um, does someone raise your hand? Kristen, do you want to try to go ahead and speak? Sure. Can you hear me? Hello, everybody. You hopefully cannot see me. Is that correct? 
work here a little bit has been to look at what the existing strategic goals are for our university, which do not include online learning at all, um, but to try to show how online learning is helping achieve those goals anyway, is for things like the number of undergraduates um, who, have, who are completing their degrees and starting to look to see how quickly those students who are um, graduating um, I'm sorry, to, to look at see those people who are graduating and see whether they've taken um, online courses or not and see how that compares to the rate of students who didn't take any online courses. Um, and so those types of things that are already part of the strategic plan, just see how online has impacted that. So that, that has helped and, and I'm fortunate that my director has a seat at the provost table so that she's able to take those data points to um, the senior staff meeting and show those, those points of impact. So that's been helpful, but I still think that it is, you know, that is still us talking about existing kind of campus-based goals. So I still am interested in the question, how do you get senior leadership looking at um, the future, which is now? And because I feel like we're still trying to prove points about things that should have been proved years ago. So I think it is kind of two different conversations. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I, you know, short of, just continuing to get in their face to say, you know, here are initiatives that are going on all around us and we're still far behind. Um, what, what's, what's it going to take to get them to pay attention is a question I still have. That's a great comment. I think for many folks who may not have online learning integrated into those um, strategic goals of the university or the school or the mission, um, that's a great way to show how the online component is still supporting um, those, those goals. So it's always worked for me in corporate or higher ed. Um, anytime you decide to solve a problem, um, whatever that may be, um, is a great thing. What else can we do? Larry? Caitlin, I'm wondering if um, a strategy, an option might be to understand the cycle for which strategic planning is done within the institution. And then understanding that cycle, if it's a two or three or five year cycle, how can you queue up this um, if, for example, well, whether or not you have um, a strategic imperative to do online learning, if you don't, it's a great opportunity to begin the dialogue. Let's say you're on a, a year-long process and at the end of this, a year from now, we're going to have strategic goals written for the next two or three years. Um, understanding what's in the current strategic plan and then trying to set the table for a discussion and hopefully a conclusion of including um, online learning initiatives and understanding that into the, the upcoming strategic goals, I think would be a really good game plan. And you might start that at a local level, whether you're at a department level, I'm looking at Gary Chen thinking, you know, that's a good way yeah. for that. And then, and then perhaps that bubbles up into the larger institutional and if it's not represent, represented in the larger institutional, maybe stimulating at a local level will help get there until it gets represented in the larger ones. So, um, Kristen, thank you for sharing your mind. Uh, Kristen just posted that Brian Utterman created a great report that shows online education by the numbers at his UW institution, which is another way to get the information out there. So, there's a resource for you. Thank you, uh, Kristen. Um, Camille, your hand raised. Do you want to talk? If you're talking, Camille, we can't hear you yet. You may have to click that microphone. Oh, you're muted. Click it again. There you go. Yeah. Camille, if you want to type it, we can. I can definitely relay. I know that that's not the most elegant way to do it, but 
By the way, I think you probably heard Ryan Uderman is here today. Yeah. And um, tall guy, uh, if you uh, find him, yeah, see so if you get him. Yeah. Get, yeah, that'd be great to get that posted. Do you remember, did he post that was it within Facebook? I, I saw it. Uh, I don't know where I saw it. You should ask him to get that as a resource. That's yeah. a great idea. Definitely. Um, I hope I have his name right. Other oh, yeah, two ends of the end she has. So that's the yeah. Yeah. Um, it was on her website too. Okay. She says, you tell me. Um, so I, I think Larry. Oh, go ahead. So I was going to say one other option or another approach that that people could use would be to look at existing um, organizational structures within the institution. Um, if your faculty senate is a strong senate and they deal with these kinds of issues, they might have um, an undergraduate or a graduate subcommittee or a, a subcommittee that deals with, um, with outreach, continuing education or anything, is to uh, talk with the chairs of those committees to think about uh, how the, how you might come in and be, you know, provide an informational report to them. Uh, it could elevate to a much larger group uh, within the Senate, but you can start with subcommittees within the Senate if you have a faculty, active faculty Senate. Um, other ones would be other types of committees that might be good institutional or college level committees that you can uh, reach out to uh, and, and, and ask. You know, I have some information I'd like to share. Um, so, in, you know, a lot of times people aren't aware that, that these topics are being discussed or that they, they exist, and by reaching out, you can actually make, um, make some headway um, and get some discussion going and be then recognized as a resource uh, for those kinds of groups. So that's something. Yeah, that's, that. that's a great point. I mean, I will say I didn't, I didn't connect it until right this moment from your comment. But I think one of the ways we've elevated and got the word out that we exist at Northwestern is because I've been invited to be on some of the committees, like the LMS committee, and working on notes and things like that. And I introduced myself, they're like, wait, director of business education, we have business education here, we have the director of it, we must have it. Um, so then I'm able to engage in those conversations, um, which is great. Um, the timeline of Larry's, too, I think there are strategic planning cycles. But if you're local to a school, the budgeting cycle, for me, that was really important. I missed it um, when I came in as director just because of timing. What I was able to do the next time is to say, you know, we budget for salary, we budget for professional development, we budget for programs. Could we budget for R&D? Mm -hmm. You want to do gamification. Well, that takes some research, and that's going to take some things. Could, could we have that? And it all of a sudden said, wait. This innovation takes funding. <laughs> um, it does. So um, check on to that too. Now, Camille, thank you. Oh, Kristen put the link to the report in here. Thank you. Um, Camille has a question. And she says, we're now um, charged with starting an online campus coming out of the strategic plan. And she needs to know, or she needs to operationalize this being online campus. Her question is, how do we be respectful of the past? Well, uh, charging in the future, particularly department chairs and faculty. Uh, so can we maybe, yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> there you go. I've been in that situation where no one at the university wanted online education and I was charged by the president to start doing degree programs. Wait, how many here have been in that position? How many have been? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's endemic, I think, to our field. So um, it helps to go from bottom up, but it also helps, as you all said, to get to know the context of the faculty. Are they unionized? Are they not unionized? Are they very <coughs> conscious and have total control of the content? You have to find the one or two faculty that want to do this, and then they'll evangelize for you. Um, if you want to do degree programs, find the one or two faculty that will get their dean to agree to fund them to spend part of their time doing that degree program. And then have meetings with all of the administrative services so you can get those changes. Because you're going to have problems uh, with, with registration, with billing, with financial aid, with all of those services unless those people are on board. So 
We really think getting to know the university as a whole. So I agree. Get on every meeting you possibly can <laughs> and, and get to know people and what their problems are in making this change. Yeah, and that's a big one for everyone. I love that other Renata too. If you have a center for and I don't forget you talk if you have a center for teaching and learning, um, we have one of those, the Serial Center. They, I called them up as director and said, could you share with me your job description for your instructional designers? And they said, could we don't have I said, okay, can you, you know, share with me what you're doing for blended learning and online learning? They said, we don't have any. Um, so I call that strategic partnership. So we've just been very quietly saying, we already do these workshops for online faculty. I will make them available to the regular faculty um, when appropriate. So they're not reworking, they're just facilitating a different way. And, and that can help a great deal. Um, just to see who comes to those. And tech, usually, the technically savvy, the innovators, the cutting edge, your champions, are the ones that come. And then you get to know them and slowly bubble up. Want to your comment? Yeah, I mean, I started off like that. And uh, we have about 15 programs now. Um, but now what we are in the same position as Camille, that the UH system is looking to develop a one uh, UH online institute. And all of these, we have four campuses. We call them universities, they're not called campuses. But we are now thinking of how to develop UH online. So we actually got um, a consultant who came and studied each contribution from each institution. And we are about to, I don't know what is going to happen, what is it? They came up with some solution which is good, better, and best. And for all of our institutions, and I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, maybe today, tomorrow, we will get to know how it's going to be structured. Is everything going to UH online? Are we going to allow, going to be allowed to teach any online programs at all? or we are all going to UH online. So buying from all the campuses, buying from all faculty members, uh, in, in stipend incentives, how the faculty is going to be reimbursed for teaching, uh, what is going to be the workload uh, for all of these faculty that are going to be involved, are going to hire separate faculty for UH online. We really don't know at this point. Uh, so those are some of the things maybe for me I don't know if it is, uh, she has other institutions that are going to be working with them, or if it's just their university moving or separating out as an uh, online component. So those are some of the things that probably we need to marketing, enrollment, mm -hmm. student services. Uh, those are some of the things that we have to look, look out for. You know. But just kind of what you said, Shasha, I was at a small community college and had to do the same thing, um, Institute of Online Education. And one of the things that I did, which proved to be successful, was to bring in all those stakeholders, like student services, financial aid, because they feel really threatened. And if you can put, if you can put them at the table, and so you're all working on that together, it, it, it you know, incorporates more buy-in than if you're kind of off in the yeah. corner of doing it yourself. Right. And, and I would say to, to add on to what uh, Kathleen said is that try to figure out a way with those stakeholders and those people to make this not a burden, but rather uh, something to engage in, something positive, new skills, yes. new competencies, um, and, and things okay. like that. I think that's very important. Um, when we partner with our library, to believe it or not, um, we had our first student with a disability in all our class, and they called us up and were frantic that the material from our library wasn't screen readable. They had PDFs, it, but had such old scanners and didn't realize what it meant to go online in this way. The student couldn't come to the library and physically get the thing. Um, that we had to go out there and, and educate them on how to use OCR. Um, and it was a great competency for them, and they really took it up and said, we want to know everything there is that you do for accessibility. We want to know more. We want to be your leaders. And it led into copywriting. And it led into all these different, beautiful discussions. Um, and they're some of our strongest partners. So, so, so what you're talking about, which is, is similar to what we've done in our institution, is leveraging what's already at the institution. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't really have uh, the budget to um, 
to, to set up, and actually our crediting body won't allow us to set up like this separate um, entity that's only going to be distance learning. All of our faculty are regular University of New Mexico faculty. We don't hire the faculty, the academic units do. So we're a service unit of sorts, a service unit that collaborates heavily, like you're saying, you find your champions, you find your partners, you find, um, so we work with the Center for Teaching Excellence, which has no instructional designers, but we have 10. Yeah. So, um, but they're also very small, and we grew more rapidly than, uh, than the Center for Teaching Excellence did. But, um, so it's, I, it's critical to know your institution and know where all these potential partners are, and absolutely, as you're saying, that you have buy-in from them, because we work with enrollment management, we work with the, you know, with the library. These, these all are the partners for um, what's not called digital education with us yet, but um, I like that it's term. still distance learning. Yeah, there's a there's a really good book out there that, that actually talks about that, but um, it's sort of flipping from the distance learning to digital education. Mm -hmm. But yeah, those partnerships across your institution are absolutely critical. And, and I will say that's important, and one of the things, I have my own consulting <laughs> firm for a very short period of time, and one of the things they said was never say no. And what started happening was it became known as sort of the technology person in a way, and the learning sciences person, and the learning designer person. And what started happening for us was these other entities, even faculty, would call up to say, you know, I got really bad reviews. I, I teach online, but my colleague who taught online went to online because you made them a better online instructor. So can you help me? And in my mission, they didn't necessarily still tell me like um, <laughs> that um, they might not be at my school. They definitely were not online learning, um, and they're not my domain. But I would quietly say, you know, then they're my pretty, but I want to help you. And yes, I will. And what has turned out from that is that as we've evolved, and we're getting more partnerships, so my department does speaker service, and we're going to share partnerships with other schools in Northwestern, they become my champions, and they become my advocates. Um, so it might not work for everybody, but for us, it was a very little extra work um, to support those people, but not really that much, but to help them along the way, and to kind of say, you know, I had those calls that the department chair thinks I know this, but I really don't. You know, can you help me fill in the gap? Sure, we'll have a private clandestine meeting at 6 30 a.m. and let me help you. Um, those things work. I mean, I'm from a country, I'm from a country, so I'm a country girl, I barter a lot. So, can you have another question? And can you, I think your question is how is program integrity impacting outreach efforts? Did I get that right? Oh, she's typing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Saying that before I disconnected with the There we go. Perfect. <laughs> We're all going to take it. That's fine. Um, Seven years ago, we started a school-based uh, office of distance learning. And it so happened that they gave it to me. So <laughs> because of previous experiences in Mexico, I was through the CREAL uh, distance education program. Uh, and with the IRL uh, program, uh, it, it helped me to uh, convince the institution on these facts, from 15 students to 250, from one program to six programs. And they say, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing this? We need to do it at institutional level. Okay, then it one came the strategic planning. Then we uh, found the roadblock, the, the challenge for me was an opportunity of the state authorization. They said, well, this is not a problem. This is an opportunity for us. And uh, one of the things we found internally is uh, online students were not paying the, what we call the quarterly fee, which is equal to like seven hundred dollars per, per per quarter. It's for health insurance, for security, for uh, on-campus services. So at the end, the, on the online students were paying less for the degree. So they give us the idea, okay, let's establish a technology fee for $10 per unit, $100 per, per, uh, per quarter. Then we'll get some funding to, to move into the next step, which is the establishment of a centralized uh, something. That, that is exactly the point where we are. We are not here in a center, institute, or school. The School of Digital Education, where all the programs would be housed. This is kind of similar. Uh, we are trying to replicate the World Campus from Penn State. 
at a micro level. <laughs> so I told my kid five visits to Ben say, well, <laughs> But the, the point here is saying to establish the, the best practice and then look for external partners like the OLC and the G, uh, Quality Matters, the Triad, and other entities. And I tell them, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. For the, and then I was placed as chairman of the Digital Education Council Institutional and chairman for the Quality Assurance. I said, wait, wait, wait. So let's do this pro for program review. Say, okay, we have already established the cycle and the, and the instruments for program review for on campus. So we need for online. And then they say, wait a minute. The OLC already has something, which is called the Quality Scorecard. And look at this. And, and now, <laughs> the, what I'm trying to say is look for the best practices outside. Partner with all institutions, learn from all from in this um, close uh, community, open communication, transparent, and look for um, the already established systems, proven systems like this this program. So that has been proven as success so this far. So please keep in your in your prayers and your meditations and move forward with this tsunami. Well, and I will say that um, again, going back to move. People didn't know that there was a some scorecard of quality matters. My office started with quality matters and has now moved into the scorecard. Um, and one of the things that Larry gave me last week, so again, I'm hearing from Larry, giving full credit, is maybe a strategy for um, getting institutional buy-in is to lay out the quality matters rubric, lay out the some scorecard, lay out Chico or whoever you think it has a good sort of assessment tool in a way that sort of Take those and says, here's the best practices. May you tell me what's important to you? Um, or what needs to be revised of those. And that's actually how Larry did um, some work on faculty development. Was in the same realm, and it gave me that idea um, just this week. So they Yeah, and that I mean, follow up on that. In the street. I gather my thoughts. So the university will ask me, going back to your earlier question says distance education, whatever that actually means, is important. But it's not in the strategic plan anywhere, other than one little line that says that teachers have access to the technology they need to do something. Um, <laughs> it, it, it says more than that, but I don't remember the things on But anyway, so thinking about how, if they really value distance education or say it's important, what does that actually mean to the institution? who creates that vision and gets it into the strategic plan. Um, we, as part of my IEL project, is what I'm doing is taking the, the OLC quality scorecard and going to do that um, for our institution. Now, you know about quality scorecard, it's not appropriate for our institution because our institution doesn't have a distance education program. Um, each of the individual colleges or departments might offer an online course where that should really be evaluated. You know, the core five should be implemented there. So I went into it with my report to the senior vice provost that I said, okay, I'm going to do this for my project, but I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to score miserably. <laughs> because I wanted to sort of serve as that slap in the face to say, okay, you really, if you're really thinking that distance education is that important, here is the best practice says we have to have these key pieces in place, and this is how it ran. Um, so that's how I'm entering into that question, right? right? It raises the question of, well, if you're saying that's not important, why is it not important, and why is it about the crap that's in other places? Like, can we figure that out? So we have about um, 10 minutes left, I right know. Our last question is, and I put them on the line first, so I got the advantage. Um, what are the guiding principles that influence the leader's action? I think we've kind of all said that here, yeah. that getting the whole stakeholder buy-in mm -hmm. yeah. what I'm hearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I I echo um, the comments made before that I've been in a lot of institutions, I've been corporate training, and I think what works at one place does not transfer necessarily to another. Um, you can take pieces of it, but I think the culture drives a lot. And you need to know who your stakeholders are and who those faculty are and, and how to work within that particular system. Um, <laughs> mission, vision, resource allocation, and buy-in. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I think that that's good. Um, and research allocation, I think that that's important, that it kind of goes back to that strategic planning piece and budgeting piece. And do you know the, the rhythm of your institution? And I also think that it's not linear. I mean, you can't just start at the top or just start at the bottom. Mm -hmm. right. you got you to gotta work it. You know what I mean? Yeah. you got to work the bottom, you got to work the top. you you, you got to go down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
kind of knowing who you're presenting to and what you need to have um, is critical because I actually once shot myself in the foot by not being prepared for all the big questions that um, an analytic person would really want to know. And, and this is where your partnerships with across your institution is important. Like we have a um, an office of institutional analytics. It used to be called um, uh, institutional research. <laughs> 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 we had that. I don't know it. What's that? What? And, and and actually, there it's so exciting because they want to work with those of us out there that want to show the president and want to show the provost, you know, what the impact of these programs are. And so they're creating these amazing. Uh, student data marks that then we're going to be able to, it's not done yet, but we're going to be able to have access to to be able to do some powerful reporting. For us, it was our predicted analytic graduate program, and I went to them and said, listen, I, I know what I don't know, and I would like to present you, faculty, with an opportunity to take our data and do some student projects. Um, so I went to them, and they did a beautiful text analytics about how is online learning or what's their perceived in the community from the text analytics, how, you know, are the metrics being done, what are we missing? And it's funny because what they told me, which I hadn't thought about, was, Haven, don't look at the reports that you get now, forget them, throw them away, don't look at them, they'll be limited. Think about what you need, and then let us help you figure out how to get the data that you need and want. So from their perspective, which I think was very powerful, um, looking at the reports that you have or the data that you're already collecting, maybe limiting you, so just another box to think outside that box. Um, and we have three minutes left. Uh, by the way, you know that she has adult completers, niche degrees, active duty servicemen. It's kind of her audience, so it's connected with a couple of you here. Um, we have about three minutes left. What are the thoughts you have about um, the institutional role of online learning? Any final thoughts? I, I would say, the, as you said, don't say no to anything. I think that's a good, a very good guiding principle. But also be open to learning anything. I've had to train faculty in accreditation. I've had to help them get their programs through the Senate. I mean, there are all kinds of issues as you're moving forward because people are very siloed at university. And you have to not be siloed. You have to be open yeah. to learning everything and, and helping out. Yeah, and I will say that um, student accreditation was interesting because my kind of clubs are really like that stuff. I do not. Um, but I didn't want to say no, right? I didn't want to be yeah. on alcohol. So what I did is I said, hey, these really, these master's degrees are really not online learning degrees. They belong to the academic unit of the graduate area. So why don't, why don't they have the accreditation process? Yes, why don't they work with the legal? And I really buy them with size. Um, so we taught them all about the individual aspects. And now I'm able to send little interesting things, you know, that I find in legislation or things are coming out to the right place, whether it's going to impact student services. And instead of saying, this is how we're going to deal with it, I say, how can we deal with it? Even though I might have in my head that idea of what we're already doing, I want to know where they're coming from. So asking the question that you think you might have the answer to, and being open to hearing what others have to say, I think is is also key, at least for me, um, and to learn all the time. There's so much in this arena um, to learn.